was raining last night. It felt good. We needed the rain. The, uh, interesting thing I read in today's devotion, I decided to take some time to kind of post a lot of all my Bible study stuff ahead of time and then really give a chance to take a long shower and shave and get cleaned up and just spend some quality time with, with the Lord, you know, because whenever I'm in the bathroom or in the shower or in the bathtub usually, God speaks to me and, you know, gives me a lot of really cool stuff. I mean, <laughs> I don't know about you, but God speaks to me, <laughs> literally, <laughs> and kind of neat, you know, I kind of enjoy it. <laughs> you know, you'd think I'd spend all my time in uh, the bathtub, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe I do. <laughs> but, quite honestly, I was thinking about, oh, a lot of things I always take to them. And the way that I do it is I just kind of think about them, you know. I, I kind of talk to God and I say, Lord, you know, what do you want to talk about? You know, what do you want to do on the videos? But also, you know, this really bugs me, God. There's a few things that, that uh, are popular that always come along. I mean, if you've been around, if you've been a Christian for at least three to five years, you know, you'll see all these fads come along. And they really are fads. They're like the latest, greatest thing, you know, that somebody either is against or for or upset about. And then every four years, you always see this massive amount of Christianity and then politics, politics and Christianity, all these things going back and forth. You know, it's almost like people don't know how to have peace. And you know, that might tell you something because the fruit of the Spirit is peace, love, and joy. Meekness, temperance, kindness, we could go out with the rest of it, but the reality of God's spirit in you causes peace. You shouldn't be full of fear or fearful because lack of knowledge is what usually fear is about. And lack of love causes fearfulness because Perfect love casts out fear. So if you really know and you really feel loved, you don't have any fear. But if you don't know who loves you and you don't feel that love, then you kind of have a lack of knowledge of who God is, really. You have a misunderstanding or maybe a misapplication of Scripture, so you don't really know that God is love. So if He's in your life, you don't have to fear. But you can always tell people that don't know God in that way because they are anxious. They are anxious full. They have high anxiety levels. They're easily provoked. They get into being constantly active because they have to hype always up that constant fear and anxiety inside to feel and run away from being still. Because what people forget is the scripture says, no matter what situation you're in, be still and know that I am God. Now, I don't know about you, but when I used to get fearful, <laughs> it's been a long time, but when I was fearful, I wasn't very still. Matter of fact, I don't think I could have sat still. And that's usually a good indicator of where a person's coming from. Because in these latter days, in these last generation that we live in, in the time that Jesus is coming again, we're going to see people fearful. This is going to be a sign of the times. And I see it among lots of Christians who are constantly sharing things that create fear. Now, unfortunately, the Bible says if we are constantly creating fear, or sharing those things that do, we're, we're fear-mongering, we're selling fear. And fear is a power. It is a ability to cause you to flee from God rather than go to God. Because most people that are fearful 
usually aren't going after God. <laughs> They're usually running away from Him in some way. But when you be still and wait, God will reveal Himself either to deliver you or to speak to you or to encourage you or to fill you with His love and His Spirit. I was thinking on these lines today when an old expression came to me that I think it was Pastor Romaine, I'm not sure, but one of the pastors that I knew a long time ago had told me something that I used a few times in writing and talking about and probably upset because, <laughs> oh well, <laughs> that happens sometimes. But what he said was, and what I wrote was this, that you're only deceived because you want to be. And you know, the first time that I heard that, whoever told me that, or whatever teaching I heard at the time, I had to stop and think about it, because I had been deceived in my early days as a born again Christian by something that really upset me that probably wouldn't upset you at all. But you have to understand my mindset. I wanted to know truth and fact. So I was very upset about this supposed big deception in my life that really made me mad. It was the scripture that says in Revelation, um, I think it's Revelation 3.20, but I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. But anyways, it says that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. You know, and he with me. So, I was taught as a baby Christian to go out and evangelize, to share the good news of my, my personal experience of what I knew about God using that scripture. You know, that worked for a few years. Then one day somebody that was obviously a more educated atheist, or probably a vaccinated Christian really, came up to me and said, you know, that's not written to the unsaved, that's written to the saved. And when he said that, I was stopped in my tracks. I knew in my heart something was wrong, and I knew I wasn't right. Because it's kind of what God does, you know. Sometimes, you, you know, when you get carried away in something, you stick your neck out, and then suddenly it gets chopped off, and you realize, oops. Well, I didn't say anything to him at the time, but I opened my Bible about, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes after he said it. And it took me a year, almost, to get back into witnessing to people ever again. I was mad, because I read it. I read it, and I read who it was to. I knew what it meant. I knew why it was written there. I knew everything all about it as soon as I read it. And I'm sure that I had read it before. But you know, I had been deceived, I felt, into doing something that wasn't right. Because had I known, I would not have shared that to so many people at the time that I did. Because I've always believed that truth stands on its own. That it doesn't need to be exaggerated, doesn't need to be hyped, doesn't need to be presented in some fancy way. Truth, as the scripture defines truth, which is Jesus, stands on its own. It needs nothing else. It needs no props, needs no hype. He's nothing else except itself. And I've always believed that about the Word of God. The Word of God will accomplish that which God has sent it forth to do because He is the one who is implementing it. He is the one who is causing it to accomplish His purpose. We can't, but His Spirit can. So, because it is spiritual, I was mad about this. And so it took me about a year to kind of argue with God about it and get back to you know, feeling confident about what I knew. Because I realized in that full year that I was mad that I had been deceived and I was mad about being deceived. So, about that time when I quit being mad, <clears throat> I read this little kind of thing and it said something about, said something about, you're only deceived because you want to be. And then later on, I actually heard a teaching on it and <clears throat> it got quite 
in depth, and I realized that, well, frankly, when I read that, you know, and when I had been sharing that before, it's because I wanted to be deceived. I wanted to make that fit. I went so out of my way, so adamant and carried away by it that I wanted to cram it down somebody's throat, just force it in there and make them do things that they really didn't want to do. You know, I felt bad about that. So then I started, in my life, re-examining everything I took for granted and began to become kind of like the Bereans, proving all things and then holding fast that which was good. Because I'd already seen how easy it was to be deceived. And later in my life, at different times in my life, yeah, I still got tripped up and <laughs> it still fell apart like everybody does. But you know, the one thing I always found true was that in every one of those circumstances that I kind of kind of got misled, you know, and kind of got sidetracked, I really was the one who did it to myself. It wasn't because somebody came along and was slick and, you know, had some really neat idea and then I went, ooh, ah, and got all wrapped up in it. No. It wasn't because, you know, oh, you know, Satan came along and whispered something in my ear, you know, and was able to trip me up or trick me up. No, because you see, even if you have an adversary who whispers things in your ear, you have to be receptive to it in order for it to connect some dots in your mind, in your head, in your heart. Otherwise, you have discernment to know that it's not true. And so, in reality, if we go with what we know we are told, then we'll always ask. Because Jesus said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of the Father, who will brains not, but give it to all men liberally. We should never be deceived, unless we want to be. And the only way you can be deceived is by yourself, because no one else really deceives you. You fall for it, and that was your choice. Today, in starting your day, it says, listen to God. Hear counsel, receive instruction, and accept correction that you might be wise in the time to come. Proverbs 19.26 You may wonder, how do I know when to confront someone about an issue and when to let it go? If you are too eager to set someone straight, it may not be God that will you. Correction must be done in love to build up the person and not to tear them down. Always pray and wait until you know what God wants you to do. You must be led of the Spirit of God. It must be God doing the correcting and not you. If after prayer you still feel you are to talk to someone about their behavior, be absolutely sure that you're doing it for their good and not your own. If this is what God has told you to do, you may not even want to do it, but it will be done as an act of obedience to Him, and you will do it in love. Whatsoever you do, do it always in love. Nowadays, most people that are running around telling everybody what to do, they're only doing it for themselves because there's a there's kind of a thing about when you want to feel superior, you tear someone down. So what we're really supposed to do is lift them up so they're smarter than we are and wiser than you are and I am. And that's what it means by building someone up encouraging them and giving them the tools to discover for themselves and grow in their own way with what they want to do. I know for myself, someone came up to me, you know, and would ask me about computers. I help them to do what they want to do. I don't tell them the right way or the wrong way. I just say, well, what do you know? And then I try to add something to what they know and show them a way they can learn on their own. And I do the same thing in life, you know, and the same thing in faith, because it's easy to become a God-maker by deceiving yourself into thinking you always have the answer. But it's a lot harder to care enough about a person to help them in what they're doing and set aside what you're doing. 